Hello, everybody, and welcome to Frontline Leadership to Transform the World. Um, in this moment of unraveling, a new generation of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color leaders are generating creative strategic innovations and interventions to combat extractive economic systems and usher in a just transition to a new economy. Today, we're gonna share how folks are working to cultivate local, loving, living, linked communities, how to democratize our economy, restore sovereignty, localize control of wealth, and restore social and ecological well-being. So welcome. My name is Nati, and I'm a communications organizer at the New Economy Coalition. The New Economy Coalition is a member-based network representing the solidarity economy movement in the United States. We exist to organize our members into a more powerful and united force in order to accelerate the transition of our economic system from capitalism to a regenerative solidarity economy. But I'll get back to, to what a solidarity economy is. I think it's important to set the scene of this moment. Um, on Friday, a national single day record was set, set with more than 226,000 new COVID cases. Hospitalizations topped 100,000, more than double the number at the beginning of November. While 42 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits during this pandemic, the stock market has returned to near record highs and enriched wealthy investors. While 80% of American workers live paycheck to paycheck, America's billionaires have seen their wealth go up by over $931 billion. Right now, in my hometown of New York City, New York is projected to lose one of every three small businesses to this pandemic. And over the next 10 years, the largest transfer of wealth in the history of this world will happen here in America. Baby boomers, mostly white wealth-owning households, will pass down $68 trillion to their millennial heirs. This is a moment, pioneers, this is the moment when we will either course correct and bring fairness to our economic system, or fall further into oligarchy and this death cycle economy. So, very gloomy, but I want to pivot us to vision together. Um, in the chat, take a few moments. Uh, what does an economy that can actually take care of our communities and our planet look like to you? What does a day in this economy feel like? What does a life-generating economy look like? One that repairs the ills of colonialism and enslavement. I want you all to take a few seconds and, and think about that and, and talk with us in the chat. <clears throat> Some responses, degrowth, decentralized. Mm -hmm. Come on, party people, what does it feel like? Just and sustainable, yes. Reciprocal exchange of goods and skills. That's a good one. Mutual, local. Yes. Time banks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Big fan of time banks. Awesome. Well, hopefully, you'll keep kind of visioning this, proactively reaching out. Yes. Like all of you who are here today. Yes, this is part of it. Great, thank you for, for going on that with me. Um, a lot of these themes you mention and dream about, um, we at the New Economy Coalition believe that the solidarity economy is the means to get to these goals of a regenerative economy. And there are people around the world working on building this more sustainable, fair and just economy. Um, solidarity economy is part of an international movement of which unfortunately the US is probably, it is probably the least developed here, but there is also a very rich history of these practices um, from mutual aid societies after enslavement to the black cooperative movement of the 1930s. Um, and what these projects have in common is collective and democratic ownership and management, meaning that people own and run businesses or energy companies or their housing situations and even financial institutions together. Um, in a lot of ways, the solidarity economy is just going back to the future, to go back to the communal life forms that our ancestors practiced before colonialism and enslavement. Um, the New Economy Coalition has members from across the spectrum building this regenerative economic vision 
whether it's worker cooperatives, community land trusts, affordable housing experiments like housing cooperatives, participatory budgeting, uh, revolving loan funds. Um, we also have members of People's Action and also other networks like the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. So I urge everyone to plug in with us at neweconomy.net and on Instagram. Um, we host an annual conference called Common Bound and release a newsletter every two weeks to inform you about these exciting experiments happening all over the country. Um, so today we're gonna hear about very local examples, but this work is happening all around the country. Um, so I want you to listen in and make sure that you connect with these leaders. Um, and I, I wanted to leave us with this quote from one of our members, COFED, which works to build uh, QTPOC food and land cooperatives that really resonated with me. Um, quote, especially in a time that may feel like complete destruction, we are saving seeds that are radiating their greatest expressions. And with that, I think these uh, these stories today that you're about to hear are, are seeds. Um, and I'm really excited to, that you are all, all are with us today. Um, and we're going to start off with Michelle from Movement Generation, who's going to kick us off with an overview of how we get to this regenerative economy via the Just Transition Framework. Michelle is a part of the staff collective of Movement Generation. Uh, they are founding member members of the Climate Justice Alliance and the Our Power Campaign. And she was recently named an Ashoka Fellow. She's also a mama like me, whoop, whoop, who organizes with other families to build movement on unceded Chochnye Ohlone territories, also known as Berkeley, California. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, take it away, Michelle. Thanks, thanks, Nati. Um, so good to be with y'all this morning. Um, shout out to pioneers in this moment. Um, we need us, we need all of us together in this way. Um, and I'm gonna just share my slides. Yeah, so I'm with Movement Generation, Justice and Ecology Project. Um, also, we are also members of the New Economy Coalition as are the other folks presenting today. And we're all members as well of the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, and I wanna really shout out the Climate Justice Alliance as I get into the Just Transition Framework, which I'm gonna share um, for the next few minutes. Um, it was, it is these uh, frontline communities all across Turtle Island and um, other lands that are connected to this continent that really their, their dedication and work and experimentation and fight and struggle and love and heart um, that went into um, what we now talk about is the Just Transition Framework. And Movement Generation has just had the honor of kind of like curating and supporting, um, putting that into a framework that we can share across our different communities. Um, so I wanna start out by just um, this little slide of Totoro and ask um, what comes up when you hear the word economy um, I can't see the chat actually, but uh, you know, often people will say things like GDP or the stock market or jobs. Um, and just wanna remind us, reseat us in um, that, that the root of the word economy is echo, um, which comes from the Greek word meaning home, right? Um, and we can, start by remembering that that is very tied to um, concepts like ecosystem or home and together where we're talking about not just a catalog of all the things in, a, in an ecosystem, but, um, but actually the relationships between the wind and the water um, how the sun hits the plants at a certain time of day, right? So it's the relationships between things. And critical, critically to understanding ecosystems is how we, um, is, is the boundaries, right? So an ecosystem could be as small as a drop of water or as large as the whole planet. It all depends on how you draw the boundaries of home. Ecology then is, is really our knowledge of home, right? How are we reading, understanding, 
um, and responding to our understanding of that ecosystem or of home. And when we think about that um, way of understanding home, economy really just means management of home or I like to think of it as care of home, right? It could be managed in very different ways, but it is the way we organize our relationships in a place, um, ideally to take care of the place and each other, but management of home can be um, healthy and sustainable, or as we've seen, it can be extractive and destructive, right? Um, um, yeah, so, and then ecological justice is really what we're all about here at Bioneers, right? We're, we're about um, the reintegration of human communities into the web of life, right? Into healthy, thriving, ecosystems that are rooted in mutuality and beneficial, mutually beneficial relationships, right? So with that, I'm gonna start with um, a little, um, this is the beginning of the Just Transition Framework, which really we just, and I, I wanna actually let people know that you can download this um, framework for free or look at it on the web um, on our website. I think um, Tina's gonna chat it for us. Um, but it's at the movementgeneration.org website. And um, it's in Spanish and English, but I'm gonna mostly be presenting these slides in English just for ease today. Um, but we can think about like any economy has some basic threads or pillars. Um, take resources or life sources, um, the air, clean air, clean water, sun, light, soil, um, combine them with human labor, which is itself a precious resource, um, towards a purpose um, rooted in a worldview that makes that way we do that make sense, and in governance. Right, so a culture, culture and governance actually support that way of carrying out that purpose. Um, in the extractive economy, which is kind of the dominant system that we unfortunately are, are um, tied up in, beholden to for the most part, although we operate in many different kinds of economies simultaneously, um, the purpose of the economy is enclosure of wealth and power, right? We can, they can tell us all day that the purpose of the economy is to lift all boats, but at the end of the day, all boats are not lifted. We know that some people are just, black people, native people are disproportionately killed, <laughs> impacted, um, extracted from, right? That is the purpose of the economy is to extract, right? And enclose wealth and power for the few. Um, so then how resources are obtained in an extractive economy and this extractive economy is really about dig, burn, dump, right? And we're seeing smokestacks in this image right now, but I wanna be very clear that we're also talking about solar panels or, um, you know, hydroelectricity or nuclear power or, you know, any, any form of, um, of resources can be extracted. It's really all about how, what is our relationship to those things. Right. Um, and then exploitation is obviously like the dominant form of extraction, right? Of human labor um, and human labor is such a key part of how this extractive system works, right? We don't get to make decisions based on our hearts and our guts. We're forced um, to work for the man um, in this extractive system doing things that are really against our best judgment um, just to keep a roof over our head. And then they get us to buy into the system, right? The culture and cosmology or worldview is rooted in a myth that white supremacy, that you know, white people are, su are supreme. Um, this heteropatriarchy and consumerism, right? Which gets us to buy into binaries and it gets us to buy into hierarchies, which are completely anathema to the living world. 
Meanwhile, governance is, is done through wealth, wielded as power. The richer you are, the dis more decisions you get to make about other people's lands. And when those people stand up, we bring in force, right? Militarism is the dominant form of governance, actually. Not democracy, let's just be very clear. So through this, um, we have globalized a mismanagement of home, right? We find ourselves in a very teetering place as we know. And so we need to transition to local living, local loving linked participatory economies um, where the worldview is one of sacredness and caring, right? Where um, we have we're rooted in all of our relations and the complexity of life um, that gives us a sense of um, humility, really, right? Where the purpose is care of home, right? Ecological and social well-being, where we are re realigning the economy with the powers of Mother Earth, and and primarily focused on restoring biological and cultural diversity, protecting and restoring biological and cultural diversity as the really the main purpose of economy. Where work um, is not jobs or production, but it's, it's all of the roles that we play um, from caregivers to water keepers to elders to lovers to friends um, and and even just the work of our bodies the beating of our hearts right the 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 way that breath moves in and out um, and the work that we do to take care of each other um, this is key because in this moment we know we can't shrink um, but we have to actually expand our role as regenerative disturbers um, in this extractive economy to transform it into something different. Right? We have to build soil as we tear up concrete and liberate our collective imaginations. So um, governance then is really about um, uh, boundaries rather than borders, right? Um, that where the decision making is made at the smallest scale at which it makes sense from the workplace to the watershed or trade shed or food shed um, and where rematriation um, to the peoples of the lands that we, um, you know, that we're, we're on um, is first and foremost, right? Um, so governance is really about collective self-determination and rematriation. Um, there's sort of several different strategies that the Climate Justice Alliance uses to organize around. We build visionary and oppositional economy, which you're gonna hear a lot about in these next, with Doria Najari coming up. Um, we're working to change the rules change the story, move the resources, and build a movement of movements. And I'm gonna focus um, especially, or I, I just wanna shout out, I guess, especially this move the resources piece, which is really um, very critical that the way we move resources has to democratize wealth and the workplace, shift economic control to communities, advance ecological restoration and drive racial justice and social equity, right? Um, and, um, and yeah, and so together we've all been working on a campaign or a, a whole initiative called reinvest in our power, um, to reclaim stolen wealth and, um, take it and slow it, spread it and sink it through our, um, community controlled loan funds and, um, and other mechanisms to be able to apply that capital towards regenerative community needs. And with that, I'm, I'm through. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I really urge everyone to check out the Just Transition Framework. There's an amazing zine that I personally learned so much when I got into this work that um, we'll be putting in the chat as well as the Reinvest in Our Power and the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, 
Just want to introduce Najari Smith coming up next, a Richmond, California based founder and executive director of Rich City Rides. Uh, he's the former chair of the Richmond Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee and has worked tirelessly to improve bike infrastructure and use bicycles to unite neighborhoods and communities throughout the Bay Area, including by creating the biggest bicycle celebration in Richmond's history. He's also involved in work around Cooperation Richmond, and you're going to hear more about what's going on in Richmond, California right now. Take it away, Najari. <laughs> Well, thank you for that um, for that introduction, and thank you all for joining us today um, for Bioneers. Um, so it's a story of like many different, of a few different things. Rich City Rides, Cooperation Richmond. I'm going to go into the Seed Commons, which is the National Financial Cooperative. A little bit about Richmond, and jumping right into it is Rich City Rides was this. It's a crazy idea of a young man who felt that he could reach out and connect with community members, people in his neighborhoods by offering um, bicycle repair um, as a way of just gathering community, getting to know people and sharing with them the love for bicycles that he had. Um, this was, you know, during a time when bicycles weren't as popular and this was a part of a cultural change, um, a move towards regenerative transportation, you know, a different way of how and of engaging with one of our most used assets in most cities, is, which is the streets and sidewalks. Um, as those, bike, those bicycle repair workshops in the park became more popular, more people joined in and it turned into them um, having these, these days where they would care for the park. So it was caring for each other and then caring for the park. And that developed into these rides that would happen. The rides became a, a weekly activity that we collectively call um, self-care Sunday, community care rides. And from these rides, um, more ideas emerged. It was a different way of looking at the streets. It was more than um, just the origin, just you know, how to get from your origin you know, to the destination, how to get to home from this other place to everything in between. It wasn't so much just about the destination, but the journey getting there. Um, the rides that we did were a huge part of how we got the word out. It was our outreach. You'd hear the music, you go to the window, you see this um, civic celebration happening and you come out and you wanna find out how to, how to be more involved in that. The rides that we did, um, not having a bike didn't keep anybody from being able to join. If somebody needed a bike, we took a, a bike, we'd furbish it and, and, and loan it out to a community member. And after one to four rides, they got to keep that bike um, and through that, we've been able to provide um, to over 2,000 bikes to community members. There was a youth that was a part of, our, part of this organization that said, you know, a vital piece of bicycle infrastructure on top of bike lanes and bike boulevards and, you know, bike racks was a bike shop. We we're in a city that didn't have a bike shop. So we took this idea and um, worked with his youth to start the first bike shop in Richmond and utilizing those cooperative principles. We said, it's not just going to be a bike shop. This is going to be another aspect of cultural change, much like the bicycle rides that we did were changed from a motor single occupancy vehicle form of transportation to a regenerative non gas powered, um, no CO2 emission, emitting mode of transportation that actually gives back to you. Um, bicycles, you know, riding a bike is good for your health. It doesn't um, zero carbon footprint and it's a lot more fun to do together. You know, just a different way of getting around. Um, the people who joined in these rides became the advocates for um, alternative transportation. 
seeing it as a, you know bringing them um, joining into the the BPAC meetings those are the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee meetings for the city in Richmond um, and extending that to we 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 took that to this idea of starting this bike shop so you have folks that are willing to start the, to start a shop to get together to start a business they have the, the the idea of wanting to do it as a cooperative they're familiar with each other but where do you get the resources for that you know where do you get the the coaching and the, the assistance to help bring that idea into fruition and that's where cooperation richmond comes into into place um this is actually this is a slide from one of our one of our largest rides and you know we had these they had this moment where we were talking in one of our one of our meetings and we found out that we we all met each other through bicycles and this is the bike shop here we worked with um, cooperation richmond which provides coaching, capital, and connections to cooperative businesses here in, in Richmond that folks that want to start a cooperative and aren't sure um, of all the steps or need help getting through certain steps to, um, to bring that business forward. Um, the bike shop in Richmond has been going and growing for the past three years um, with three members and now increasing our total staff to six. Um, these three new members came in and didn't know about cooperatives, but with this um, live example of what that is, they're learning about how they can eventually become not just a staff of the business, but also part owner of this business. This has produced other ideas for different types of businesses that could emerge um, that come straight from our members. Things like uh, you know delivery service, a um, local um, food truck service, and other other different um, types of business entities that could be produced, but not doing it from the um, I guess the the more popular method of just doing it as a you know a single owner vehicle, but doing this as a as a collective, a, a cooperative, working with each other to build something rather than in that, that shielded individualism, knowing that our power is, is magnified and manifested when we do it together. Um, so with the development of Cooperation Richmond, um, which is one of the many peers within this, the National Financial Cooperative, which is the Seed Commons. We work together to bring in investment nationally to, um, to, re to reinvest locally in doing that into a, in our power um, through the Financial Cooperative into the local loan funds. So this is our... This is our, our vehicle, our, our method of, of reclaiming our wealth to meet our community needs. So pulling from the extractive economy and into the regenerative economy um, to help shift economic control to the communities and democratize wealth in the workplace, um, advance ecological restoration, drive racial justice and social equity, relocalize more production and consumption and retain and restore our culture and traditions. In this case, cooperative being a you know a cooperative economy is rooted in our in our our ancestral culture. And the CECOM is um financial cooperative and the local loan funds. We follow the methods of non-extractive capital, so non-extractive finance. So the the businesses that we help start up we give them different terms than you find in the in the extractive economy where we make things to where you you can you make payments when you're able so we don't call for repayment until 
you're making a profit. And we work with you on, on developing the business so that, you know, we can find out if there's anything else that you need on top of capital. It's not just about the capital, but also it's um, working with that, with that group, with that business to help them get to a place of being um, profitable. We don't ask um, for, these, for these businesses to put up any collateral. Um, the finance is community governed within the cooperative. It's the members that, that would govern the fund across the all of C Commons. It is each one of the peers, um, like Cooperation Richmond, that govern that, um, that national fund. Um, and through this, we ensure that the community wealth stays and circulates in the community. We operate on shared principles that include productive sustainability, maximizing community benefit, radical inclusion, non-extraction, of course, and building cooperative democratic ownership within these communities. Um, the first cohort of peers in, um, in the Sea Commons and included folks from Baltimore, um, Boston, um, Cooperation DC, the Detroit Community Wealth Fund, Arroyo, um, the Working World, um, PACA is the Philadelphia um, Cooperative Fund, um, and the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, and Cooperation Richmond. And we've been including new, new um, local loan funds into the C Commons as we grow. Um, Cooperation Richmond here locally was has been able to um, make investments into the bike shop to allow it to grow and sustain and become more profitable over these past six years. The members of the bike shop, um, myself included, I'm one of the one of the founding members of the of the Rich City Rides um, bike shop. Um, our commitment is that this is a community asset. You know, we're committed to having this shop here um, long after we're no longer, but not just thinking about us in the time of now, but thinking into the next uh, next next ten generations. So, um, CJA um, is the home of the Just Transition Loan Fund and Incubator. The CJA Just Transition Loan Fund and Technical Assistance Program is one part of a larger integrated approach towards just transition within CJA. The purpose of the, climate, the CJA, that's the Climate Justice Alliance Just Transition Loan Fund and Incubator is to support the development of local loan funds, support just transition projects through technical assistance and non-extractive loans and support political education and skills training on debt, um, finance, capital, and the commons. So in this um, graphic, it's looking at the, the financial cooperative and the, the local loan funds as a tree. So at the root of the investment dollars that are pulled into this container, this large tree that is the um, financial cooperative that then is able to direct those to each one of the branches, which are the local loan funds, and then the leaves, which are the, the different projects, the different enterprises, the different cooperative businesses that we're looking to, um, that we're helping to grow and grow together. Through the National Financial Cooperative, Cooperation Richmond, um, the CJA Just Transition uh, Loan Fund, we're able to share the capital, but also share services. So, you know, we have a bike shop here in Richmond. What if there was a bike shop that wanted to be started in DC? In DC, well, we could take the learnings from what we've done here and share that there. What if there's a a cooperative that was done in DC that we wanted to do here. Well, this is the, um, you know, this is the, the steps that it took to do this. These are our suggestions. Of course, things could be different for that locale, but at least you have, um, you have that experience that you can pull from. 
Um, all of the pairs stay within, stay in contact with each other. So as we learn, we share what we learned. Um, we're able to cross connect on that um, and stay linked. And, um, and through this, you know, the tree grows and it grows and it grows. And this is how our members support each other. I'm going to, um, and with that, you know, I'd like to pass it to Doria. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Najari. Um, yes, linked, loving, local, and also connected. Definitely check out Seed Commons, Cooperation Richmond. Um, really excited to introduce you, Doria Robinson, a third generation resident of Richmond, California, and executive director of Urban Tilth. Um, Doria is a co-founder of Cooperation Richmond, a worker-owned cooperative developer and local loan fund. Doria has previously worked on organic farms in Massachusetts, where I'm at right now, at Veritable Vegetable, a woman-owned organic produce distribution company, um, and has a lot of experience in the world of organic um, and food cooperatives. Doria is a certified permaculture designer and has also led the development of Urban Till's three-acre farm in Richmond and the Farm to Table CSA social entrepreneur venture that now serves 440 West County families each week. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Doria. Um, I can't tell you just how exciting it is um, to be here at Bioneers, you know, we're right across the, the bridge from where Bioneers usually takes place. And um, for so many years, kids like me who grew up in Richmond just would never have access to the kind of knowledge that gets shared um, through uh, Bioneers. And for the last 10 years, we've actually brought youth to Bioneers and just really kind of turned, turned them on, getting really excited about all the different ideas that are here. So it's pretty exciting to um, be on this side of a panel for the first time. And really, I feel feeling really proud right now just to share our story in Richmond. Because I think so often, if you know anything about Richmond, California, you know about our troubles, our struggles. You know about the refinery, <laughs> the biggest uh, point source pollution of um, greenhouse gases in the state of California is right here, uh, five blocks from the place where I grew up. Um, you know about the maybe the fire that happened in 2012 that actually spurred um, the development of Richmond Hour Power Coalition and the work that I'm about to share with you today. You know, so for over 100 years, Richmond has been really um, reacting to the impact of extractive economy literally stationed right here in our front yards or backyards, <laughs> in our houses, all the air that we breathe. Um, without any real control over, over that impact on our lives. Um, and like many communities that are frontline communities, um, the extractive industry, uh, the petroleum industry, isn't actually the only stressor or the only threat at our doorsteps. We're also dealing with you know, economic injustice, um, prison system injustice, uh, injustices around health, um, and, a whole collection of injustices that kind of compound. And so that you actually have to have a whole systems approach if you're gonna be able to solve any of the problems that we face. So when the fire happened, big explosion and fire at the uh, Chevron refining in 2012, a collection of organizations who had been organized for many years successfully fighting the refinery, trying to keep it accountable, actually realized we got to a point where we needed something more than the fight. We needed to actually start to articulate the vision, the attractive vision of what we wanted to see, not just what we didn't want to see. And so um, from a, a group that actually um, formed in response to um, kind of holding Chevron responsible for their impact of the, after the fire, we formed the Richmond Our Power Coalition. Um, well, the whole disparate group of organizations that weren't all necessarily environmental justice uh, focused organizations, it was a cross sector uh, collaboration of organizations that had a different vision for how our community should grow and develop. You know, how our economy 
should work, how we should take care of our homes. Um, so using the just transition strategy that Michelle so eloquently introduced earlier today to, you know, in the bad, which we had already been doing, um, change the rules. So literally going in and, you know, kind of organizing for power to change the political rules um, so that we could actually create the circumstances so that we could thrive. Um, and then also changing the story, you know, changing the story, not just the wider story of, of what we should do in the, in the face of climate change, um, but also our, our own stories, the story of Richmond. You know, for so many years, our story has been a story of us as victims rather than us as leaders. And I think that a, a large part of our, our movement towards our, our move, move, movements towards changing the story is changing our own story as well. Um, moving the money because as a very low income community made up of immigrants, transplants from the, from the South, um, black folks who moved up here looking for work, trying to escape Jim Crow South in the forties um, and the fifties, um, and just low income people of color, immigrants from Southeast Asia, we don't have resources to make the changes that we dream of and the changes that we need. We have been extracted from for sometimes hundreds of years and we don't have the capital because it's been taken from us. And so moving the money is critical part of this, of this um, writing of the world. Um, and then of course, building the new and organizing for a movement of movements. All of these strategies are what the collection of organizations here in Richmond got together and said, okay, using this strategy, how can we not only fight for envision, but also create the economy that we need? Um, so we had been doing so much work already to end, you know, uh, the bad in Richmond, you know, now even moving forward to start talking about decommissioning the refinery. We know that petrochemicals, um, oil, it's ending the end of its life journey here on earth. And what will that mean for us being the home of one of the biggest, you know, refineries in the state of California? What is that um, toxic legacy that we should start thinking about now so that when there's a transition, we transition in a just way, along with, you know, not just thinking about just transition in terms of um, the direct extractive economy in terms of, of resources, in terms of um, energy, but also other forms of extraction, like how, you know, we have been historically impacted by the criminal justice system. Um, and how that system has extracted and kept us down for so many years. So, so many strategies to end the bad. Um, and then making real concrete ways to change the rules so that we can lift up our communities, you know, advocating for healthcare for all, advocating for the rights of nature, um, advocating to fully enfranchise the vote, advocating for participatory budgeting, advocating for looking at public land and creating a public land policy, which allow for unlanded people, like most renters, low-income people in urban centers, to gain access to public land, to actually transform their situations and build the infrastructure that they need to thrive. So changing the story through all different types of things, using communications, using podcasts, to actually speak first to ourselves, to tell our own story differently, to take back our story um, from, from the, the kind of dominant media that tells us we're victims, that tells us we're not capable, that tells us we don't have good ideas, that tells us our ideas can't scale, um, and retelling our, our, our own story from a place, place of power, from a place that we, um, where we know our own capacity and we know our history and we know what we could be capable of, especially <laughs> if some of the, you know, institutional systemic barriers are moved aside. And most importantly, um, we have just such a large list um, of concrete solutions 
that this community is in the process of putting into place and would like to put into place because like Cooperation Richmond, like Rich City Rides Bike Shop, we know we can make positive change if resources flow to the places where, where we need them. <laughs> so we're in the process now, one of our members, Richmond Land, and creating a Richmond Land Trust to actually you know, hold land for a community, um, hold land in such a ways that we can create housing that isn't subject to the housing market. So we can address gentrification, we can address houselessness in a um, equitable, just, fair, and loving way. Um, we are working in Urban Tilth, my home organization, in creating a local just food system that reconnects the urban core with, I mean, Richmond has so many food deserts, you know, and we also are surrounded by a whole hub of small family sustainable farms that actually need access to market. So we're working to actually reconnect our, our urban core to these small family farms that are under threat from, uh, from uh, kind of uh, urban sprawl <laughs> um, and development and, and connect rural to urban and reconnect um, our communities, our families um, to create these much more sustainable nodes of local food systems, local food exchange, um, creating a hub in North Richmond, one of the worst food deserts in Richmond, where people can access food, fresh, healthy, whole food that has been grown in a sustainable way locally um, and bring straight into their homes um, so they can have the fuel that they need to create, to nurture our bodies so we can do things like fight the coronavirus. <laughs> so we are, don't have so many preventable uh, uh, chronic diseases so that we have the immune systems that can resist and be less susceptible when things like the fires and other things that are coming down because of climate change. Um, we have, the, we have the, the physical tools we need to be more resilient. We're also talking about creating an energy commission where our energy sources, whether they be solar, local solar generation, or even the existing PG&E or MCE, it's a local um, uh, distribution network, is actually governed by a local commission, a commission made up of community members that are become directly involved in how we get energy to our houses. Like um, Things like creating a cooperative Main Street. One of the big visions of Cooperation Richmond is to take our Main Street that has been boarded up for many, many years and, and kind of destroyed by the coming of malls and, and kind of big box stores and, and whatnot, and actually, you know, take back those boarded up buildings, those boarded up, you know, uh, uh, stores and create cooperative enterprises, like the ones that you saw, like the ones you heard about with Rich City Rides Bike Shop, where it's not just a bike shop, but it's a place of inspiration, a place of connection, a place where people get reconnected with their health, a place where people get inspired. So starting to fulfill our own needs in this community, ourselves, um, through these cooperative models, reimagining the, the public squares, the public spaces, our grocery stores, our you know, laundromats, creating our own grocery store so we don't have to worry about, you know, having the right um, calculus to keep uh, a major chain here and interested in our community. Community-based housing initiatives, getting that public land to create the housing that we need so that the people that we grew up with, our elders who are now living in the ditch in our parks have, you know, <laughs> just living commission conditions, have a, a roof over their head, live in a home, live in a community where they're wholly a part of it. With the public land we currently already have, but it isn't being used for these purposes. Um, and then creating things like resilience hubs that um, Asian Pacific Environmental Network has really been spearheading here in Richmond, knowing that climate change is already here certain parts of it are not reversible. And we actually need to create plans to be more resilient as the impacts hit us 
first and worst as a frontline community, as all many frontline communities will experience. We need to have in place these resiliency hubs so that we can take care of our people. Um, and then also public bank. Um, it, so often in um, revolutionary or progressive er uh, arenas, people don't wanna talk about money. <laughs> They don't wanna talk about resources. They don't wanna talk about economy. But when we think of it as the care for our home, when we think of it as the fuel that we need to make and sustain the changes that we need, there's an imperative that we actually consciously, proactively interact with economy, with banking, with um, resource and capital redistribution. So public banking is definitely also a part of, part of what we see as building the new. And I think, over this last year, it's been so challenging. Um, the pandemic has been transformative um, for urban tilth. It meant, you know, shutting down our normal collection of education and outreach and community in, in, in engagement programs. But it also meant hyper focusing on what we could do, which was grow and distribute food. Throughout this whole crisis, we were able to triple our distribution of produce and get it to the families that most needed it, keeping them out of long, you know, lines for food banks <laughs> so that they could stay home and stay safe, um, serving our seniors, serving our disabled, um, bringing food right to their door, keeping our young people employed in doing this work and then nurturing the relationships we had already started to create with our local farmers so we can keep this food coming into our communities throughout the crisis. We never stopped, we never went down, we never had to pause. Our networks for food were never empty. <laughs> we, we had abundance and we had a model that we had been creating for the last 10 years um, that was small that we scaled up pretty rapidly in response to the pandemic. And I think the biggest lesson we learned was that we need to keep scaling it. We need to keep growing this model because this is resilience. Having these local redundant systems that can serve our community in a crisis or out of a crisis, that can keep people employed in a crisis or out of a crisis is exactly the kind of solutions that we need, especially ones that are rooted in right practices on the land, so, you know, supporting farmers, who already are committed to sustainable agriculture. I think a part of this and a part of our focus at Urban Tilth is really looking at land. And it's, it's not just Urban Tilth that's looking at it. There's, there's a, a, a number of different organizations, collective, collectives, networks that are looking at the need to move land back into the hands of the people. Um, there's a great quote that I ran across recently when I was reading Monica White's a fabulous book, Freedom Farmers, about um, the role that black farmers play and have played over the, over the years in the United States in, in justice movements, um, from the civil rights movement to um, the abolition movement, black farmers and black landed peoples played these critical roles for movement support. Um, and so just outlining the importance of land um, she quotes uh, Malcolm X actually saying that revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. There is only so much you can do to change the conditions of your life if you have no land to call home, if you have no home base and you're just moved from place to place to place. If you don't have a place to create that store, whether it be a grocery store or a bike shop, you know, if someone could triple your rent on that, that cooperative that you created so that that cooperative no longer has a place to operate. Land is central, central to transformative change. So in Richmond for us, we've been working on this farm. Um, to operate as this continual community owned. We actually are in the process of, of buying this land from Contra Costa County. It's a currently county owned land. Um, so central community owned hub of healthy food, healthy activity, um, 
uh, movement building, <laughs> place for people to gather, place for young people to come and transform their minds, get ex introduced to all different kinds of ideas from what is a compost toilet to, you know, how do I grow my own food and eat more healthy or use herbs to, you know, help me with depression instead of drugs and alcohol. Um, the North Richmond Farm Project is one of many um, land acquisition um, asset building initiatives that the Richmond Hour Power Coalition is taking on. Um, along with that, we're thinking of ways, other ways that we need to transform our community, creating safer um, places, ways for people to get around. We actually have like really amazing community resources that have no access. Like you can't get to it unless you have a car, um, which a lot of people don't have, um, where it's really unsafe to walk, you know, to the local creek or to the local uh, park because there's no sidewalk. So we're doing things like taking on and working with our local government agencies to create things like the Fred Jackson Way Project, which is gonna be a whole greening, um, kind of greenway initiative that has um, green infrastructure in, in, in like weaved into its uh, DNA. And I think the revolutionary idea around this and why I wanted to include it is because we don't wanna just come up with projects that we get some outside agency to come in and kind of build. We contract with them and that's it. This project is based on actually having a training program um, that trains local young people from North Richmond and San Pablo who are, don't, are not on a college track to do green infrastructure installation and maintenance as uh, a just transition job. Like this is the kind of thing that we need to do. We need to be creating projects that create the opportunities that our young people, that our residents, that our adults, that our families need to thrive and we need to be directly employing them in their own liberation, in their own improvements. Um, I think that, you know, kind of as I close up uh, here, one of the most important things to say is that none of these things, none of these visions can be real, not one, unless we move the money. You know, since the inception of the United States, money, resources, capital have been moving out of the hands of the native people, out of the, out of the bodies, like labor capital, moving out of the bodies of African, stolen African peoples, um, out of the, the bodies of, of those low income folks that are, came over as indentured servants and into the hands of the few. Um, we need that capital moved back, back into our communities back into communities like Richmond, back into communities, coal country communities in Kentucky, back into communities, the native communities in Alaska and across the whole continental United States so that we can actually create the change that we need. You cannot create change from goodwill alone. It's just not, it's just not real. It's not what happens. It's not possible. Um, you can do a lot. <laughs> but you can't create the kind of change. What you can create if you're, if you don't, if we don't take this moment, this move of moving money back, um, is you can set yourself up for a self-fulfilling self prophecy of funding something just enough to fail. Um, and that's what we wanna say pretty loudly and pretty centrally that we need to move the money. And so in Richmond, we've created a just transition fund that's housed by one of our local, um, uh, community uh, foundations to encourage people to support this ongoing work, put money into this fund so we can build that bank, so we can transform our downtown, so that we can create, you know, community solar um, uh, projects, so we can solarize our seniors' homes, so we can do the things that we need to do to transition this economy in a just and equitable way. And I think that people just just so thankful for visionaries um, like Kat Taylor, um, who are in that position of, you know, finding themselves with great wealth and also finding themselves um, wanting to do what's right. <laughs> so Kat Taylor has this amazing initiative um, called the Good Life Giving Pledge, where she herself has pledged to 
give back one third of her wealth before the end of her lifetime. And she's starting with donating a million dollars to Richmond Hour Power Coalition, as well as a collection of other um, projects across the United States. And then looking for others to do the same, find four other people so we can have a seed fund of $5 million to begin this transformative work. Like this is the scale and the type of, of moving the money that we need, even larger scale, to make the, the, the impacts at the pace that we need to really answer the call of this moment, the call of climate change, to answer the scale of the need, um, the depth of the need of transformation um, that we have. And so how do we, how do we catch people's attention? How do we do this work? How do we work locally and everywhere, you know, and then connect our movements so that we're not working in silos, so that we're not hyper focused on one place and not seeing the larger global picture um, and 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 whatnot. And that is the last kind of um, part of the just transition framework, which is organizing a movement of movements. So not only working across sectors in the work that we're doing, so we're not working in our silos of I only deal with food and I only deal with energy, but working across sectors and connecting initiatives um, so that we can make compounded kind of positive change. Working on things like people's assemblies so we can keep activating our communities one of the sleeping giants is the low income people of color who have been disempowered and feel like their voice, their energy, their life force is just not needed for this economy. And, and quite frankly, for hundreds of years, it, it has been purposely disempowered um, so that can kind of be kept down. So get doing things like community assemblies, people's assemblies, to bring voices out, to bring voices back, to expose people to ideas, to get them connected to movements. Um, creating things like the Just Transition Institute, where people can go deeper and learn. There's been a lot of unlearning. Our, our education systems are abysmal, especially the public education system, which I love so much and believe in so much. Um, it, it does a, a massive, you know, incredible disservice to low-income people, um, not giving them the tools they need to really thrive. And so creating our own institutes where we can start to have that political education that we need to take back our power. Um, voter engagement. People need to vote. We need to vote. <laughs> we need to vote locally, most of all. But we also need to understand how to consciously vote nationally as well. Um, and then being members, being members of the Climate Justice Alliance, a national alliance of, of organizations like Urban Tilth and Cooperation Richmond and Rich City Rides and, you know, uh, the Communities for a Better Environment, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, all of these organizations getting together and, and strategizing together for change, working locally, but strategizing nationally for change. And also being a part of things like It Takes Roots, which is a collection of four uh, alliances. So the Indigenous Environmental Network, the Climate Justice Alliance, and the Right to the City, and the Grassroots Global Justice, um, who are organizing massively, nationally and internationally, across sector for transformative change. This is the recipe of what I believe we really need to make the changes that we need. Um, to keep life going on earth. Mm. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Doria. So powerful and Najari as well on the ground and Michelle as well. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we asked you to envision what this economy would look like and basically you answered the question because these panelists kind of went through and, and shared real time examples um, we have a Q&A right now. There's tons of really amazing questions. We have less than 10 minutes left. Um, some questions. With so many small businesses going under now because of COVID, how much are you seeing and leading a regenerative response that can bring many of them back as cooperatives? 
I can answer that quickly. Uh, in New York City, there uh, there was an effort this week that launched called Owners to Owners, where the city government will directly be supporting the transition of baby boomer businesses into worker cooperatives. So in, in our world, that's a very exciting development for New York City to be taking that on. It's being led by some groups that you heard of today, Seed Commons, The Working World, the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Um, if you're interested in that, I would definitely plug in with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. You can plug in your zip code and see what worker co-ops are in your area right now. You can see all the amazing policy work that they are doing. Um, but that's something I'm seeing that's very exciting. Anyone else like to answer that question? Yeah. I mean, I'd love to just chime in really quickly mm -hmm. um, in terms of Cooperation Richmond, what we saw with Rich City Rise, and Najari could speak to this too, is that during, during the pandemic, our cooperatives saw more business than normal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because people look at it as more than a business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they look at it as a community connection point. I mean, Rich City Rise was giving out food you know, it was one of the places where the school district was giving out meals during um, the beginning of, of the COVID uh, crisis. And, you know, what other bike shops were doing that? I mean, they're, they play a cooperative, worker-owned cooperatives can play a really different radical role in a community. And I think that our uh, community members recognized that and saw that and supported those businesses even more through the crisis. Amazing. What are um, important key strategies in moving the money and making it happen, in your view? I mean, I, I can, I'll say, I think number one is um, organize. So like wherever you are, organize with your folks. So um, we had a success this year where the Universalist Unitarian Assembly made a big investment in seed commons. Um, and we hope that that will help to create an organizing platform for folks everywhere who are part of that institution um, to organize within their local congregations and their families, et cetera, to make investments into this. Um, and, and I say investments, but I think where people, usually when people can make those kind of investments, you can do gift capital. Um, and just turn it over and turn it over back into the control of the communities who know best. You just heard from two amazing, powerful organizers in Richmond. Um, and they and we, you know, we're connected to powerful organizers in Detroit, in the Gulf South, in Boston, in, you know, so wherever you are, right? Um, that's that's really important. And then I would just throw out this this um, this term that we're a lot of us are using right now, which is like permanently organized communities. How are you organizing in ways that are both like responding to the shocks that are coming our way just constantly and more and more, right? Um, in ways that are gonna ground us in the kinds of shifts that we need to be making for the long haul so that we can use that organization. I think, you know, Doria just named how Rich City Rides was that in, it has been doing that and then showed up in that way um, as the pandemic began. Um, so anyway, just permanently organized communities. How are you organizing? How are you um, making that for the long haul? Yeah, and make sure you follow Movement Generation on Instagram. There's a great meme series that'll walk you through all of that. You can be sharing that with your folks. Um, quickly, last question. What is your relationship to local government? What do you need from the city and county governments to help? And I do wanna plug the New Economy Coalition has a, um, people's uh, pathways to a people's economy. So any interested city officials or government, we've laid down a policy vision of how, how we get to more worker-owned businesses, uh, more community-owned power, et cetera. I would say one thing that I think local people really need from their local governments is for local governments to believe in the power of local people. So often local governments will look outside of local, <laughs> local residents for you know places to invest in in terms of you know uh, what they're going to put city dollars towards in terms of the development and whatnot they will not invest in local residents and in the vision of local people they'll look to national you know big box kind of uh corporations and other corporate interests way quicker than they will to local residents who've been organizing for change. And I think that that has got to change. You know, change mm -hmm. happens locally. You can't top down economic development. 
Hmm. Well, we got some other amazing questions and we hope that you will all plug in with us on our social media, on our websites and, and, and get down with your, your folks where, wherever you are. Um, I wanna thank Michelle, Doria, Najari and Bioneers and the Bioneers community for having us and uh, Frontlines to the Future is where it's at y'all. Thank you so much. Grateful for y'all. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Peace Thank out. You.